Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Iraqi voters went to the polls last week with no illusions regarding the impact results will bring to their lives, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all of which are in short supply in the country formerly known as Mesopotamia. The low turnout was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not much will change in the new parliament, and coalition negotiations seem sure to drag on for many weeks. But regardless of the makeup of the next government, one feature does suggest itself. Most Iraqis, while arguing about everything else, have had enough of foreign involvement in their affairs. Whether it is uh, the Iranians or Americans, Iraq wishes to handle its affairs on its own. Is it really the case? And if so, what are the implications for Washington, Tehran, and here in Jerusalem? To explore this issue, we're joined from northern Israel by Colonel in Reserve Dr. Anan Wehbi, who is a senior fellow at the ICT at Reichman University, as well as a lecturer at Haifa University. Thank you for joining us, sir. Also joining us from central Israel is Colonel in Reserve Miri Eisen, who is an Israeli public diplomacy, security, and intelligence expert at the Institute for Counterterrorism at Reichman University as well. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. And with us here in the studio is also our TV7 analyst and host of Watchmen Talk, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, take it away. So Iraq, of course, um, is uh, an artificial uh, creature of uh, the British um, some uh, hundred years ago, um, being uh, built from scratch by taking the uh, Sunni, Shiite, and Kurdish uh, regions of the so-called uh, land of the two rivers. Um, and in a way, it's a sort of a Lebanon, but of course, a Lebanon with oil, um, a much more powerful and larger Lebanon because of the uh, uh, sectarian violence, uh, the never ending one. And because it borders uh, so many other Mid uh, Middle Eastern powers in the Iraqi case, of course, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, and Turkey. So um, no one really expected uh, that uh, these elections will bring a new day, a new future to Iraq. And uh, we have yet to see whether uh, what happened over the last uh, 18 years uh, or so uh, since Saddam Hussein, uh, a Sunni dictator uh, trying to rule um, a Shiite majority country with uh, Kurdish autonomy. Whether what happened uh, during these years is going uh, to change. Up to now, the uh, outgoing and perhaps uh, uh, next Prime Minister too, uh, Al Qadimi, a former uh, security chief, a pro American one, uh, managed to hold his coalition, but it may change. Uh, we uh, probably saw the Shiite cleric uh, Muqattad al-Sadr uh, gaining strength. Um, but as you said in your introduction, most Iraqis have had enough of Iranian intervention. Iran, of course, um, was Iraq's mortal enemy in the um, eight-year um, Gulf War in the 80s. And um, Iraqis do not want Iranians to run their affair or to run through Iraq in order to reinforce Hezbollah and uh, uh, Bashar Assad. Again, Syria was Iraq's enemy uh, up until uh, several uh, years ago. So um, both the domestic uh, politics of Iraq and the foreign policy are yet uh, to be seen. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Wehbe, I'd like to ask you uh, next with regard to uh, the fact that uh, when we heard al-Sadil's victory speech, if you will, he, he mentioned two very specific points. Uh, the one is uh, his uh, will that uh, all embassies should be allowed to be uh, present uh, in Baghdad, uh, uh, in the green zone, so to speak, and uh, uh, signaling, of course, with this to the Americans that uh, they are interested in American presence. But at the same time, he also emphasized that he's not interested in uh, foreign intervention or uh, in intervention by foreign powers in the affairs of Iraqis, all the while also rebuking Iran and, and its 
proxies uh, operating Hashti Shabi, uh, the popular mobilization forces. So it seems like uh, El Sadr, a person known for his uh, Islamist ideals, who has uh, led uh, incursions following uh, 2003 uh, against uh, the American armed forces and, and Western allies, uh, is now trying to somehow re identify Iraq as a sovereign nation. How does that actually uh, converge with the fact that according to all accounts uh, and based on Western intelligence assessments, Iraq is going to constitute the, the uh, vast ter territorial battlefield between East and West as well as between the United States and Iran in particular? Yeah, sure. Uh, we all know that uh, Iraq, uh, geopolitically speaking, is a very important uh, place uh, in, in our area, in the uh, regional uh, political order. It was in the past and it is today. Uh, and uh, this place is forming also the, uh, the future political order, whereas the local forces on the ground um, in Iraq itself, and I'll come to that, and the regional uh, forces as well. And of course, the superpowers are here again to stabilize this, this uh, place. Um, historically speaking, Iraq was um, in the forefront of the uh, Arab uh, uh, arena uh, uh, and uh, facing the Persian uh, side, where uh, this, these borders were uh, very um, political borders between the Arab world and the Persian side. And now, after the uh, the U.S.-led invasion in 2003, everything has changed. And today, this sectarian uh, country, uh, it's really a lot of non-state uh, um, and sub-state forces uh, rise again and trying somehow to form a new politics internally. We should remember inside Iraq, uh, two uh, different dimension in this sectarian structure. First one is the religious dimension between the Sunni and the Shi uh, sides. The Shi are the majority, almost 60 percent. Uh, they've been waiting for ages to dominate the state again. Uh, they've been given right now the opportunity to do so dem democratically. Um, and the second dimension is the ethnic one between the the Arabs, Sunni, and Shia, and the Kurds in the north, where the, the Kurds, that they are 20% of the uh, of the state, they are dreaming of the uh, national state of Kurdistan, and uh, in the in the regional uh, politics, we see once again that the the West um, um, are likely to support uh, the, the the Kurds. In, the, in their national struggle. So Iraq is to be stabilized again, uh, but the main issue that is put on the table here is the loyalties to Iran and the, how Iran should be pulled out uh, to, um, to its borders uh, to stop interfering via Iraq uh, in Syria and in Lebanon. And uh, to, to stabilize Iraq internally is crucial also for the whole area. All the regional states like Israel, Egypt, that is involved again and attended the conference lately in, uh, in Baghdad. Of course, Turkey uh, are opening a, um, their eyes on this uh, state and uh, it should be stabilized where uh, the interest can uh, meet again in order to, uh, to come with a new regional uh, political order where Iran is out and uh, Iraq is back with the Arab world. Indeed. Colonel Eisen, your take on this? I want to add in two dimensions I'm kind of surprised we haven't spoken about until now. The first is the word Daesh or the Islamic State. And yes, it's demolished, perhaps, in Iraq, but the heart of that Islamic State in, you know, the decade not that long ago, the, you know, 2013, 14, even 15, perhaps 16, and its impact um, from Iraq throughout the, past, the Middle East, 
So when we're talking about post-election SPAC, part of what I'm certainly looking at is the stability factor so that Iraq does not become a, a platform for the development of that type of um, regional destabilizing horrific entity like Daesh, like the Islamic State. The second aspect I think is very important in post-election Iraq is, as you said, Jonathan, the um, man who kind of gave a victory speech um, represents Shiites. And what to me is important is that in Iraq, let's say 40 million people, half the population, is under the age of 25. Our viewers know that I am obsessed by this aspect of the Middle East. I think that the younger generation in Iraq has perhaps different expectations, both on the national level of what Iraq is, similar to something we saw in Lebanon, where they don't necessarily just look at it through the religious. Um, that they actually are looking at it in a new, albeit hard to understand, national aspect that they're scared of the alternative, that they want a stable, Middle Eastern, Arabic-speaking, and that point on the board is important because that's not part of the Arabic-speaking, but a country where they can have a job, a future, stability, and security. I still think a lot of their identity, the younger generation, comes from the mixture of religious and tribal. And that will impact looking into how the Iraqis will build their future. Indeed. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Owen, however, uh, when we're talking specifically about the Iraq, uh, Iraq was always known as uh, the, the country where Al-Qaeda was the least loyal to uh, the organization, at least its operatives. And then uh, when uh, the time came and bin Laden was successfully assassinated, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi seized the opportunity and swept away the operatives from Iraq, who formed then uh, Daesh. Uh, and of course, this had uh, implications for Adha Wahiri, the Egyptian-born uh, leader of Al-Qaeda, uh, who was then diminished in, in power. But uh, if we can draw an analogy to the situation in Afghanistan, where we saw members of the Taliban defect from the Taliban and join uh, Wilayat Huraya, uh, the, the uh, district of Huraya of, of the Islamic State, uh, we saw that the moment the Trump administration bombed their headquarters with a Moab bomb, the second most lethal bomb after, or devastating bomb after the nuclear weapon, uh, many of the leaders and operatives of Wilayat Huraya defected back to the Taliban. Are we now able to see a trend uh, within such organizations that operatives from one group, which uh, has similar ideological perspectives, just a different leadership, may now yet again uh, seek the alternative, Al-Qaeda, and we may now see a, a state that fosters new terrorist organizations that are emerging following the situation throughout the region? Because we are not in a laboratory, uh, we cannot calibrate the uh, change in power that uh, we wish uh, to, to have uh, happen. Iraq was always, until 2003, too strong. It competed with Egypt for prominence in the Arab world. Uh, it fought uh, Israel several times, was the only Arab country um, taking part in the 1948 war, not to have signed the 1949 armistice agreements. It uh, sent expeditionary forces, launched missiles, and was only brought down by the American invasion, the second one, the second Bush administration a war against Iraq 18 years ago. The problem is it turned out from being too strong to too weak. There is no strong central government able to enforce its will on uh, indigenous forces, such as the ones uh, you mentioned and Miri Eisen mentioned, 
which uh, arose thanks to the American withdrawal um, early last uh, decade. And um, it does not have the power to stop Iran from sending weapons uh, to Syria or launching missiles and drones towards Israel uh, from the eastern border, the Iraqi-Iranian border, not to mention the western border, uh, border around the al Qaim area or Bukamal uh, uh, pathway uh, in Iraq and, and Syria. So it is very, very difficult for outside forces to bolster the government so that it can stand on its own and fight both the militias, the proxies, the foreign uh, powers, it will take several years, even if it has the will to do it. Indeed. Uh, Colonel Eisen, I'd like to uh, follow up on, on a point you mentioned earlier. Uh, to what degree is the tribal construct of Iraq impacting uh, the way in which uh, the various governments operate the various uh, organizations because it is a federal construct with multiple districts with governance and and uh, towns and cities each one having his own interest with his own tribal construct is this now going to impact to a certain degree the the outcome of the near future we don't look at the tribal aspect it's still very strong not just in Iraq, but I think that in Iraq, because of the Sunni-Shiite divide, the Sunni-Shiite Arabs, and then the Kurdish aspect, we look at the Kurds as being one arena, but it's also very divided within its own tribal loyalties. When we talk about these kind of tribal loyalties, I think perhaps, Jonathan, that's one of the aspects where, as we say in Hebrew, a stranger would not understand that. It's something that you need to step into to understand how important it is, how much it impacts the way that people both vote and act, how they act together. So if the younger generation is looking for jobs, is looking for a future, they're still very much tied within their own tribal loyalties, and I don't see them breaking that mold. Mr. Oren, uh, we lost connection with uh, uh, Dr. Wahabi at the moment, but I'd like to ask you specifically, to what degree is Israel wary of, uh, let's face it, Iran is utilizing Iraqi soil for its interests in the region. It controls more than half of the 40, 44, 43 militias that make up the uh, popular mobilization forces of Orhash Tishabi. And it is actively pursuing a policy of aggression towards the United States with uh, uh, Salami, the, the Major General Salami, the commander of the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Forces, declaring openly, our goal for this year is to kick out the United States from Iraq. Something that at this stage, at least from a observer, seems like uh, the uh, Iraqis are on board with the Iranian plan. Well, the Americans wanted out and uh, have actually left in 2014 only to come back uh, because uh, it failed and led uh, the vacuum led to the rise of uh, Daesh. Now, Israel has uh, two uh, strategic interests in Iraq. The most important one is that Jordan uh, does not collapse. Jordan is Israel's security partner. Jordan, of course, has always been a buffer state between Israel and Iraq, and it is in Israel's best interest that uh, King Abdullah and uh, his security forces stay in power and uh, do not let anything which happens in Baghdad uh, impact on the Hashemite kingdom. As happened to his brother. Indeed. The, the, the second interest is the one you um, are referring to. Uh, how to make Iraq strong enough to resist Iranian pressures, uh, be they direct through its uh, uh, revolutionary guards or uh, uh, Quds Force, or indirect, their various proxies, militias, and, and uh, what have you. And there is another interest and this is what happened in Erbil uh, last month, when all of a sudden there was a call uh, on Iraq 
to sign peace with Israel in line with the uh, trend uh, recently in the Gulf, normalization, Abraham Accords. Now, of course, the Kurdish region already had um, strong ties with Israel, not only going back to the time when Israel was allied with Iran against Iraq. This is before the uh, Iranian Revolution. But also because the Kurds have been helped by Israel humanit- uh, in a humanitarian, economically, and other uh, aspects. And there is really uh, no reason why Iraq not join Jordan and Egypt and the Gulf countries in having relations with Israel. Now, of course, uh, it led uh, to a backlash, this call in Erbil, but this is a trend which Israel should cultivate along with the United States. It was quite strange that even when the United States ruled Baghdad, it never bothered to put pressure on uh, its uh, friends there to sign peace with Israel. Quite precarious, uh, also considering the fact that uh, the current leader has already, or the current leader, the victor of the latest uh, uh, elections uh, last week, did state that he's not very keen on normalizing relations with Israel, something that is quite unfortunate considering the implications well, of such let's, a move. Let's uh, uh, see the distinction between rhetoric for public consumption Behind and, the scenes, and what happens uh, in other channels. Indeed. Colonel Eisen, we're drawing near to uh, the end of the program, and of course, uh, the timeshare has grown for each of you uh, due to the connectivity issues. But I'd like to ask you uh, with regard to the fact that when instability reigns in a country, we see the Iranians enter, we see uh, various uh, actors enter into the country, which are not necessarily uh, democratically inclined, to say the least. Uh, as opposed to uh, Western societies and, and the state of Israel seeking to be included at least uh, in morals and values uh, in the same norms as the West dictates these days, uh, you can see a certain clash of interest here. Now, uh, what this basically means for Iraq, that if indeed instability continues to reign, what we may see in the near future is uh, quite a challenge in bring, bringing foreign investment. We see an, a significant increase in Chinese companies and Russian companies enter into this arena, uh, as well as Iranian interests, of course. But at the same time, uh, the Iraqis are not quite uh, capable of handling those, as is the case in many other countries around the world. How do you view this? I definitely see this aspect of letting in new, different um, foreign powers. Until now, we've been very focused on Iran that has an immensely long border with Iraq and on the United States and less on other forces, both within the Middle East, but as you mentioned, China. In that sense, I think that Iraq, kind of like Syria, whatever happens inside there under Bashar Assad, but that Iraq would like to see some outer force help them rebuild themselves. And China is certainly the one who would be able to do so. China, Japan, both of them need the oil that Iraq has. But all that that does is build infrastructure. The question is if that will bring in jobs, development, and something that could stabilize But with all of those together, I do not expect a democracy. And from an Israeli perspective, how do you see uh, prospects of potentially normalizing relations, seeing Iraq join the so-called circle of peace of the Abraham Accords? I want for a moment to be a little Pollyanna and say that in Israel, we have at least the descendants of the 150,000 Jews that used to be a backbone within Iraqi society that were murdered during World War II in the Farhud and then had to leave with the establishment of the state of Israel. Iraq was very anti-Zionist, anti-Israel. But like with Morocco, I want to hope that the fact that we have such a large and proud Israeli contingency of Israeli Iraqi Jews who are very proud of their Baghdadi and Basra and Mosul um, background, 
that maybe they could be part of that bridge. But on being Pollyanna, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Mr. Owen? Well, you know, the um, uh, Iraqi pipeline uh, to Haifa, uh, which is the reason why the various stations along the line, uh, as well as the airfields built by the British to protect them, are called H3, H4, and so on, H for Haifa, and the other transportation hub, which both Elat and Aqaba uh, could serve. Uh, you may remember that during the Iran-Iraq war, there was um, a proposal by the Bechtel Corporation to um, uh, lay out uh, either a pipeline or a railway from the uh, Red Sea towards uh, Iraq with Israeli agreement. This can all happen. The Mediterranean, the Red Sea, towards Iraq, a very, very good proposal uh, if uh, uh, some stability is achieved and if there is uh, some relations between, some relationship between Baghdad and Jerusalem. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to take this opportunity initially to thank uh, Dr. Anan Wahabi in absentia. I'd like to thank also Colonel Eisen for being part of today's panel and Mr. Oren as well. And I'd like to thank our viewers uh, also, and we will see you next time for yet another episode of Jerusalem Studio. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.